It's such a fantasy life that every time someone does get killed, you suddenly snap back to reality. We often tell lies or pretend to be someone else if things become particularly tense for some reason. And what you would call undercover cops um, a rather a fascinating example of this because they place themselves in situations of, of stress or extreme danger as a job. In Michael Levine's case, he worked for the Drug Enforcement Agency in America for 25 years. And if he ever forgot who he was supposed to be, he was dead. You're acting. You don't have the luxury of completely losing yourself uh, in the role, although too many people do. They're gone. You know, they, uh, they lose their identity. You have to become, you literally have to become this person. My first experience, I was in Bangkok for three months living with Chinese drug dealers. It was, this was a 24-hour-a-day thing. There was no chance, you know, I was afraid, I was terrified of what I might say in my sleep. Um, I woke up in Bangkok in 1971 before dawn and had the most terrifying experience of my life, and that is I didn't know who I was. Some part of my brain gave up, maybe it was overworked, and I was lost. I was terrified of moving, I was terrified of saying anything, and this part of my brain was groping around for who am I? And the, the most horrific fear was that it was gone forever. I was in South America for three years. I was doing different cases, but I was always somebody else. And it's hard to turn that off. Psychological problems are tremendous. In my career, there were three suicides right in the office. You know, right where, uh, as we say, swallow the gun. Right in the office. You feel completely vulnerable to the people uh, you, whom you're working on. They can kill you. You know it. You, you, something automatically happens where you start to identify with them. There's a kind of honor about them that doesn't exist uh, in any bureaucracy. A kind of honor about them and a kind of machismo, too. And what compounds it is, for instance, everywhere I went, when I reached the top of the drug world, I found the American government. I found central intelligence protecting them. You, you lose respect for whom you're working for, you question everything you're doing. Now you compound that with fear of your life and looking at people who you have to admire because if you don't, it shows. The time is 7 o'clock. It's time for the Expert Witness Radio Show with Michael Levine. This is Mike Levine, Expert Witness. Bienvenido, mi gente. Los oyentes, mi gente favorita. You can go too. Welcome back to WBAI 99.5. Listen to sponsored radio, the Expert Witness Show. They have a show called The Expert Witness Radio Show. And all of us agreed on one thing, that almost nothing that was produced in mainstream media was even near the truth. So uh, the show is ha having frontline people to tell you the truth about what Hollywood is uh, kind of depicting, what the New York Times is calling all the news that's fit to print, because it's really not. Hey, did you know that four out of five men who claim to be Vietnam veterans are not? Stay tuned as your expert witness tries to understand the fragility of our identity. I mean, who are we? Just a minute, hear it for yourself. But you, William, you, that, I, I know you had, you must have had a really severe personal crisis because you fell in love with your target. You seduce people out of their lives. Most of them would rather be dead than, uh, you know, suffer what you're about to put them through, the ultimate in treachery. You, you uh, gain their confidence by making them like you and trust you because they're looking for every sign that you are exactly what they really suspect you are. And you're convincing them, no, uh, I'm your buddy, you know. Yo soy, yo soy tu amigo, yo, yo, yo soy tu compadre. Then when they trust you enough to include you in their crimes, uh, to they often include you in their family life, you say, well, no, I'm really the worst thing that you could expect. You're dead. Bad guys trusted me. 
always trusted me. I, I studied them, and I understood their likes, their dislikes, everything about them. It's getting in step with them in a kind of psychological way. I get in step with them. I think it's all part and parcel to why bad guys accept me, because uh, I must look like I, there's larceny about me. I was asked to kill, to prove myself. I don't think I can tell you what I did, though. I'm sorry. It's, it comes under the category of uh, resolve every situation in your own favor. So it'll have to be a mystery. <laughs> but I got out of it successfully. <laughs> It's one of the most volatile situations you, you can imagine. They call it an undercover set. Uh, at an undercover set, what's there is an enormous amount of adrenaline, guns, money, drugs, and it's like gas being uh, put into a room. And the room is filling with gas and everybody's flicking matches. Before I got there, they're setting up a trap. As you could see on the tape, my men are hiding in a hotel videotaping them setting up a trap as we later found out to kill me. I was not supposed to leave that parking lot alive. All of them had guns, and they were just waiting to see that I did come with the drugs. It was a reverse undercover. They were buying the drugs. And it's a terrifying thing, terrifying. But as terrifying as it is, it's also addictive. It's a high. And you see, my car is there. I'm undercover, I'm posing as a Pakistani. I wanted to get as much evidence as I possibly could, so you, as you see me go approach the car, I have what looks like a beer can in my left hand. That's a tape recorder, and I put it right in his face. On my left leg, I'm wearing, I had bell-bottom pants. I wore them long after they were out of style uh, because he carried a 9 millimeter pistol. My men had one order, and that was, let, give me a chance to get as much evidence as I could against them. The minute the, hit, the other car starts to move, close the trap. They waited until I brought the drugs to the car, and they started to move. But a girl who looks like she's 17 years old, she's an undercover agent, and she walked up and just stuck a gun in the car. Just the shock of seeing a kid with a gun just froze them in their tracks. And uh, then, of course, I was arrested with them. I think Ernest Hemingway said that you know, once you've hunted a man, nothing else will satisfy you. And I think that's about uh, the truth of it. Papo Mejia, uh, who I targeted, was one of the most prolific murderers in Colombia. That's somebody who you know, belongs in a cage. And, and I felt you know, a great deal of satisfaction in putting him in the cage. And uh, although he's out right now, his lawyer said, I'm not at the top of his hit list, though. He says, there's a couple of people before me. <laughs> when I look back, uh, yeah, I did live out all of the, that fantasy, but a lot of terrible things happened, terrible things. Uh, I don't want to think, I wake up uh, at night crying now. I never get it out of my soul. I can't get it out of my brain. I, and uh, I, I, was, I did it as a, an American representing the United States. <laughs>